Hello, Family Church. We are really glad with you to be together with you here studying through this sermon series called The Hall of Faith. And I don't know about you, but this has been powerful for me as, as we've gone through and looked at Hebrews 11 and looked at men and women from the Older Testament to, who were re- responding in faith to God. And we also, especially last week as we talked about Samson, we looked at the fact that they are deeply flawed people, which is encouraging to us that the, God is so powerful he can use even flawed people, and obviously he doesn't want us to sin, and he wants us to grow and to transform, but in that process, God is powerful, and this weekend we are looking at Samuel, who is a godly character who God used in a wonderful way for many, many years, and there's so much to the story that we could tell a lot of the story, but we're going to focus specifically in on the prayer life, the the way in which prayer impacted Samuel's life and how what we can learn in three important lessons about prayer from the life of Samuel. So my brother Rex was still in high school when he had the privilege of going on teen missions. It was something in our little church that allowed us to to send kids out and be a part of a, a ministry of God around the world somewhere. And Rex was about 17 and he went to Mexico, not like close to the border, like way down below Mexico City. And so in teen missions, you go, first of all, for a boot camp, and a lot of kids actually get saved there. It's a powerful ministry. And then he was gone out of country for maybe six, seven weeks. And then they were back in Texas, and they were there for debrief. And he uh, met up with another kid from our little church there in Green Acres over by Coos Bay. And Lance, his friend, called his mom. Let him know he's back in town. Let him know he's okay. You know, connection with mom. And so... When Lance's mom tells my mom, hey, my son called and they're okay. My mom said, well, if you you talk to him again, you tell him to have Rex call me. And so a a puzzled call, you know, this is the day when you got to put coins in a a machine and it's long distance and you're dealing with all of that. And, And so my brother Rex calls my mom and she says, oh, hi, Rex. It's so good to, to hear from you. And Rex says, what did you want, mom? <laughs> totally oblivious to what a mom feels when their 16, 17-year-old kid is out of country for weeks at a time. And, and in Rex's mind, and he says it's still, well, I can see the logic of it. It's like, I, I've been okay for a long time, and I'm going to be home in a couple of days anyway. What do you need, mom? And, and I think it's such a a funny story, partly just because of how oblivious he is as a kid, and now he has a, a son who's in the military in North Carolina and checks in about that same often, same, same time frame. But, but I think the deeper part of that is that he was really saying, I don't need anything from you, Mom, so why would I call? And, and I think that's some of the blindness that we have about prayer, is that we often see God as a vending machine, that if I need something, if I'm in trouble, then I pull some levers to try to get what I want. And I think you'll see in this story a much deeper picture of how powerful prayer is, not only because we connect to the living God of the universe, but because it changes us. But at an even deeper level, it's that we are in a relationship with God, that he doesn't just want us to check in when we're in trouble, even though we clearly will check in when we're in trouble but he wants prayer to be part of a relationship with us. And so I want us to look at the story of Samuel, but first of all, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and just remind you that we're in this section at the end where it says, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson. And and he goes through these just one word mentions. And in that we have David and Samuel. And so we are focusing in on Samuel this week. And Some of you may not have been as invested in the Older Testament. I I think it's easy for us to focus on Jesus and on the epistles that tell us how we should live. And maybe we don't know well, or we see the Old Testament as just a bunch of stories. And I want you to see these as real people who have real struggles and real messy faith and a real relationship with God. And in fact, Paul himself in the New Testament says, there's a value in learning about and reviewing and knowing well the Old Testament. And he says, 
Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. You see, we don't have all the stories of what God has done in the past. We only have a select few. And he says those were written for purpose to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. You see, we need to be deeply invested in all of the scriptures because he said, first of all, it teaches you how to be resilient, how to be tougher, how to be enduring because when we're facing hard times of isolation and school choices and, and all the difficulties that are going on in our world of division and, and the deep questions of right and wrong that are being thrown around. It says, we go back to the scriptures and we realize there have been a lot of hard times before. And godly people have clung to God and they've, he has brought us through. And it says, through the endurance taught in the scriptures. And then he says, because of those encouragements, you will have hope. And so, as we look at the Older Testaments, I hope that you see it as an incredibly important way to help us today handle what we're, what's going on in our lives, the chaos that's surrounding us, to help us be people who exercise our faith by prayer, that prayer is really an act of faith. And so, as we walk through this, I hope you ask yourself the question about what is my relationship with God look like, especially as expressed in how I pray. So, to begin with, Samuel starts off his life as an answer to prayer. Now, last week we looked at Samson, and Samson's birth was announced way before he was ever born. But not so with Samuel. Samuel actually came into a situation where his mom was having a great deal of difficulty. So, the story is there's a, a man named Elkanah, and he has two wives. And one of his wives, Hannah, and the other wife, Peninnah, and the difference between his two wives is one of them is able to have children and one of them is barren. And it says particularly when they came up to the, the place where they worshiped God, the place called the tabernacle, he said particularly at those times, it was kind of a feast time. And it says not only did Peninnah have children, but she kind of rubbed it in. She kind, of, she, she kind of threw it in her face and Hannah was just heartbroken. And I think it's very interesting in the scriptures to see how many stories start with the impossibility of what man can do when God comes in and, and how many women are barren and the story starts about being unable to have children until God answers. So the story is in this time of great difficulty when she is heartbroken, what does she do? And it says she goes to the tabernacle and she responds to the intense struggle in her life with an incredibly fervent prayer. In fact, she's praying so so fervently and in such a raw way that Eli, who is the, the chief priest, who is the keeper of the tabernacle, he thinks she's drunk. He, he walks over and he says to her, woman, put away the, the alcohol. Why are you drinking and why are you coming into the tabernacle drunk? And she looks at him and she says, oh, that's not the story at all. Let's pick up what this says when actually the story happens. It says, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and you remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. In her intense struggle, she was praying in a raw way. You know, you know, when things are fine, you can start with the King James prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Bless this, bless that. When you are in deep trouble, you hit your knees in the hall and you slide up to the bed and you go, help me. Sometimes I think maybe my prayers, your prayers are way too processed. We think praying is about sounding good. And I think one of the most powerful things about the prayer in the scriptures is some of them are so raw. They're just throwing to God, here's my heart, here's what I'm feeling, here's what I'm thinking. And in fact, chapter two of First Samuel, where we find this story, is all about Hannah's prayer. And there's the more process that after she's worked through it, she, she can pray a, a more poetic prayer. But right now she's so raw that Eli thinks she's drunk. And I guess out of that, I would just lean in for a moment and ask you the question, what do you do when your life is in a chaos, when there's struggle going on? 
In fact, let me ask you kind of a specific question. For the last several months, we've been going through times of isolation and divisiveness and arguing and, and toxicity at many levels. Many people have been thrown into chaos with their kids at home and homeschooling and, and perhaps with their jobs up in the air. And let me just ask you, have you prayed a lot more in the last five months than you were before? Has that been your heart response? And I don't know about you, but I'm more of an activist. My first question is often, what can I do? And sometimes prayer doesn't feel like doing anything. But you know what? Prayer is the best and first response. Why? Because prayer is powerful because it's so much more than I can do. Prayer is powerful because it taps into a relationship with the God who said, let there be light, with the God who created the universe, with the God who, who has power to control everything. You see, I am so limited, and chaos shows me how limited I am. And yet prayer is so powerful because it gives us an opportunity to come to the God of the universe. And my faith says, God, I can't handle this, but you can In fact, I like the way Pastor Ed says, he says, often I wake up in the morning and I begin thinking about all the problems in my life and the problems in other people's lives and the struggles in the church and the decisions we've got to make. And and he said, I try to spend enough time praying so that my picture of God gets bigger than my view of the problems. You see, hear that carefully. God is always bigger than our problems, but our perspective, our way of looking at it is often our problems are front and center. And so she comes, and she comes to God, and she says, not only am I praying fervently, but she says, I'm making a vow. I'm showing my deep seriousness. And and this doesn't mean that you have to make a vow when you pray, but it clearly shows the, the deep connection and commitment. She said, God, if you give me a child, when I that's the longing of my heart. When you give him to me, I'm gonna give him back to you. And Eli sees her and he reproves her and then finally he says to her, God is going to grant your desire. So God speaks to Hannah through Eli, through the priest, through the the man of God there. And so then it says, and in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. The very word Samuel, his very name means heard of God. And there was a reminder every time Samuel heard his name that he was an answer to prayer that his mom had called out to God and God had answered. And and I think that that's a wonderful picture, but I also think there's a caution here. That God always answers our prayers. Sometimes he says yes. In this case, Hannah's request was answered. Sometimes he says no, because we're like children and you don't give your kids everything they ask for because they don't always know what to ask for. And sometimes he says, wait. (laughs) I think that's the hardest answer. God always answers. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says wait. And we have to have the faith that believes that just like Hannah was crying out about a very personal thing. She wasn't asking for the nation. She was asking for her own life. But in that, God heard her. And so then she'd made a vow. So then what happens when God gives you what you've deeply desired, what you think will make your whole life. And I imagine there was some struggle in Hannah's life. And yet the scriptures tell is that what she did is she waited till he had grown up a little bit. She weaned him. She brought him back to that place where he could, you know, be independent. And she made him a little robe and she took him back to the tabernacle and she delivered him over to God. Now it's interesting. It's, she says in the vow, I will give him to you, God, and A razor will never touch his hair. It's interesting, you put two characters together. Samson was the long hair with the muscles. Samuel is also a long hair. And he was the one dedicated to God to serve in the tabernacle. And he probably did just a lot of cleaning up and taking care of things. And and he was the servant there. And, And I think this is also an act of faith on Hannah's part. And I think there's a powerful lesson here that's often missed. Is that Eli is a failure with his own sons. And it comes out in the story that that he's not been a good father, that he's not restrained his sons. And as they grow up, they become immoral and they are actually dishonest and using their power and their privilege to to get what they want personally. 
And I, and I think this is an important lesson. Some of you are step parents. Uh, some of you are foster parents. Some of you will go through the process where you pour your love and your care and your, your desire for your kid to know God, but part of the time they go to somebody else's house. And in that house there may be different standards and different language and certainly a different belief in God. And I want you to see that, that Hannah's faith was so strong that she entrusted the most precious thing in her life to somebody who had already failed. And she believed that God would call her son, that God would raise her child instead of trusting Eli. And for those of you who have to turn your kids over to somebody else for a period of time, let me encourage you to pray fervently because God can work in your kid's life no matter what the circumstances that they are in. And that's really their only hope. And so let me encourage you as an act of faith that when your kids are not with you, you need to double up your prayer time. You need to to pray for them even more because God is the one that's got to work in their life. So, Prayer is powerful because God answers it. Prayer is powerful because God listens to us. But then there's another aspect, what we see in Samuel's life, is that there is a part of our prayer time that is not talking, it is listening. And I think that we are often weaker in this, that we often come to God with a list of requests. We often come to God with, here's my problems, here's my needs, and and we come with our intercom stuck on send. And I think there's a second lesson in Samuel's life is at a critical moment when as a young boy, he's grown up in the tabernacle. He's grown up around church. He's grown up around the teaching of God. And in fact, you think it's hard to be a preacher's kid or somebody that, that goes to church and you wear a, a, a church t-shirt to church or to, to school and you may get mocked or you may get teased for it. And think about Samuel. He has this long hair that said, this kid is set apart to God And yet it says that there's a point in his life where he comes to where he has to have a relationship with God personally. And it says in this chapter three of 1 Samuel that as a young man, God begins to work and speak in Samuel's life. The faith before has been Hannah's and Eli's. Now it becomes Samuel's. And here's how it happens. It says, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Let me pause there for a minute. If you're a kid who's grown up in a Christian home, if you're a youth, if you're one of the students that you've heard about God and you've been to youth group, you go to camp and, and maybe you, you have a knowledge about God, but that's not the same as knowing God. That knowing God is a personal relationship. I heard a great statement once that said, God doesn't have any grandchildren. God has children. And even if you've grown up in a church setting, in a home where God is honored, You have to come to a personal decision yourself of beginning a relationship with God and surrendering. And in Samuel's life, this is how it happens. It says, the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And so he's sleeping at night and Eli's in the other room and he hears somebody that says, Samuel. And he gets up and he runs to Eli and he says, what do you need? And Eli says, I didn't call you, go back to bed. And this happens three times. And on the third time, the Lord says, Samuel. And Samuel gets up and he goes to Eli and he says, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I think it's sad that it took Eli three times to realize it was God reaching out. But parents, I don't know that we always realize how God is reaching out to our kids that sometimes the things they're going through and the struggles they're having are really God's way of getting their attention. And there are those moments where, as a kid, you, you pray when your family prays, you pray at meals, you pray at church, you, you pray in those things, but there are those moments when you finally have to say, God, I'm gonna pray myself, by myself, for that relationship with you. And knowing about God is much different than knowing God. And so... Samuel goes back and he lies down and when God says, Samuel, he says this this statement of surrender. I'm I'm listening, I'm ready. Speak for your servant's listening. And God gives him a message and it's not an easy one. It's a very difficult message. And God rarely speaks to people audibly. It seems like this was an actual audible voice because he kept running in the next room thinking it was Eli. Eli. But God speaks to us in various ways. And I believe that we need to cultivate the ability to listen. 
God rarely speaks audibly. He can do it if he wants to, but that's not how he speaks to most of us. For most of us, it's that nudge in our hearts. It's that putting a thought in there. And in fact, Pastor Will has been challenging us that in our prayer, instead of running in with our mouth running, that we come in and we say, Lord, the church is going through a lot of struggles right now. What do you want me to pray for? And sometimes just waiting in that quietness, God will just plant a thought in your mind. And you say, how do I know it's from God? Well, God stuff has God flavor to it. You kind of, yeah, that's what, God wants me to pray about that. That's a God thing. I can see that. <laughs> Quite often, it's, we see it's God because it's not like me. It's not my usual perspective or not my usual thoughts. And so Samuel lies down and God speaks to him and there is this moment where he begins this personal journey with God. And in fact, the next morning, Eli says, what did God say? And the message is a very hard one for Eli. And Samuel has to tell Eli that his house is going to be destroyed and his sons and he and his sons are going to die in the same day because God is judging their sin and they've been rebelling. And so he has a very difficult beginning of his listening to God and speaking. But it is a, an incredibly important moment for him as he listens. There's another place in Samuel's life where we just see that listening to the Spirit of God, listening to him talking. And we're going to jump ahead in Samuel's life where Samuel is the judge for a period of time and then he anoints a man named Saul who is the first king of Israel and then he fails and then God tells him, I want you to anoint a new king and that king is somebody that I am going to choose. And so we pick up that story where God is using Samuel, who's an older man now, to go and to be the next chooser of the next king. And so it's in chapter 16, if you want to fast forward there to the story, it says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. So his assignment was, go to Bethlehem, there's a guy named Jesse, one of his sons is going to be the next king. Isn't it interesting? I think this also points something out about prayer. Prayer is not only powerful, but prayer then begins to change your perception internally. That when Samuel cried out to God, God began to change how he saw things. And then in this moment, he goes there and he looks at the firstborn son. And he says to him, man, that guy looks kingly. He's tall, he's strong, he's good looking, he's a soldier. I believe he should be the next king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God said, you're looking with natural eyes. You're looking at him as a human being and you're judging him based on do will people think he looks kingly? And I'll tell you, I've got x-ray eyes. I'm, I'm looking past the shield and I'm looking into the heart. And prayer is powerful because we talk to God. Prayer is powerful because it becomes personal as we cry out to God. And prayer is powerful because it changes our perspective. In my own life, there was a moment when I was as a young kid Grew up in the church, and like Samuel, I knew all about God, and, and in fact, I knew the Bible stories very, very well. And I remember there was this moment where, I think I was about in seventh grade, and my brothers and I would go out, and we lived right across the street from a desert area, and, and it was a you know, wasteland, basically, and so we would go over there and shoot arrows. And we kind of figured out that it was a lot easier, we only had like five or six arrows, and we had to carefully guard them, because we weren't, didn't have very many, and so we would shoot them at things, and then you'd have to walk way out there and get them. So we figured we'll make this more efficient, and we started shooting them straight up in the air. <laughs> Kids, do not try this, because if you shoot it up in the air, what goes up will come down, and if it hits you, it's a very harsh uh, reaction. So, but we were doing this, and so we would shoot them up in the air, and then we would go and collect them, and somebody else would get to shoot. And we went and we found five of our six arrows and we couldn't find the last one. And so 
we were looking and we looked all around and everybody had looked and we were just frustrated. And I remember it was one of the first times in my mind when I wasn't with my family, when I wasn't at church, when that thought came into my mind, I should pray about this. You, you ask how you know when it's the voice of the Lord, it's like that. It's like when it's not what you normally do. What I normally do is look harder or just get frustrated. That, that quiet voice of the Spirit said, why don't you pray about this? It's kind of weird, you know? Like, let's stop looking for this arrow and stop and pray. Does God ever nudge you like that? Like, maybe you should mention this to the group and maybe you should stop and pray. You always feel like, I don't want to be that awkward person. But we did. I said, I think we should pray about this. And so we gathered around and actually I remember we knelt down and, and I was kneeling there and just saying, God, we lost this arrow. Can you please help us? And you know, we were, it was kid prayer. But I remember that moment when I looked up from praying and I just looked right out there and like 20 yards out there, there's the arrow as clear as day. And there were all these weeds and all these things that looked kind of like arrows, but as soon as I got done praying, I saw it immediately. And I think that story illustrates both points. That as a young person growing up in church, there's those moments when you begin to begin that reaching out to God in prayer where it becomes personal. And I think it illustrates the second thing too is my eyes were open because I prayed and all of a sudden, and I, I don't think God does that every time, but I think God loves to reward our faith and say, here it is. And it's funny, because here it is, you know, years later, I still remember that moment of looking up and just, it's like right in front of you. How could you not see that before? And I think that's another sign of God speaking, is when the perspective becomes clear and you begin to go, oh, that's what I should be doing, or that's what I should be thinking, or that's how I should handle this situation. Why? Because God has changed your perspective. See, prayer not only does things in the world, prayer changes me. And that may be even perhaps the most vital part of it. So that happens to Samuel. He goes through Eliab and he says, here's the king. And God says, nope. He's got the wrong heart. And so he, he goes through and he, and he looks at all of the sons. And he, he says, you and I are different. You look on the outside, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so he goes through seven sons. And everyone's like, this is a good one. No, that would be a good king. And he gets done, and God said no to all of them. Can you imagine his confusion? <laughs> I'm supposed to come to Bethlehem, Jesse's son, here they are. And so he looks in puzzlement to Jesse, and he says, don't you have any more sons? <laughs> and Jesse says, oh, the, there's the kid. <laughs> yeah, David, he's out with the sheep. Somebody's got to keep the sheep. And, and I think next week, as we walk into the story of David, this is probably a seminal moment in, in David's life where He's the leftover that's not even considered. And God chooses the youngest and the weakest and the ones that everybody else overlooks. And he says, call him in. And when David walks in, God says, that's the one. And in Samuel's experience, he says, so he sent for him and had him brought in and he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and he had handsome features. So God didn't not choose Eliab because he was tall and good looking. He says, here's the key. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David. And Samuel went back to Ramah. You see, David's description is often a man who has a heart for God. And even in his many flaws, we see that all the way through his life, he had a heart for God. And, and when Samuel responds to the message that God gives him, then the power of God comes and is transformed in the life of the person he's praying for. So, prayer is powerful because it taps into a powerful God. And prayer is powerful because it changes our perspective. And I want to go back to one more lesson about prayer in Samuel's life. And this is a time when he has already anointed David as king. This is the end of his story. Now, let's go back to the timeline. Here's the story of Eli serving as a priest, and then when Eli dies, Samuel takes over, and he's called a judge or a prophet, and so he has a period of time ruling Israel. He is the, the man who is leading, and then you come up to this point right here where Israel comes to Samuel, and they say, 
Your kids are not like you. This must have been an incredibly crushing moment where he was thinking his sons would take over after him and they came to him and they say, we trust you, you have integrity, your kids, they don't. They haven't turned out like a man of God's kids should turn out. And so we are not trusting them and I'm sure he must have felt attacked and he must have felt like he was a failure. It must have been that incredibly difficult time. But they said, we want a king. We want to be like the nations around us. That these judges who come and go aren't like the nations around us. We want a king. And Samuel is deeply hurt. Not only is he disgraced for his parenting, now he's being rejected. And I tell you, rejection hurts all the time. But when you have poured your life out for people, when you've tried to serve them and help them, and they reject you, it, it is terribly painful. And so in that moment of embarrassment and hurt, he listens to God. And God says, you know what? They haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. But I want you to go ahead and give them a king. And so Samuel anoints Saul as the king and he warns the people and he challenges them for this next period of life, the next period of time that they follow God. And then they, they look at him and they, they wonder what their future for him is going to be. And I want you to hear the words that he says in this difficult time with people that have rejected him, with, with people who are reminding him of his failure. And I want you to see what his response is. It says, for the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. So he reassures them that even though they have failed, even though they've sinned, even though they have rejected God's plan for them, that God has not given up on them. And then he goes on and he says this very powerful statement, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you and I will teach you the way that is good and right. You know, I had, I'd heard that verse many years ago, but I'd kind of forgotten about it. And as I'm reading through this story, that just jumped out at me. Samuel said, you've hurt me, you've rejected me. You're not doing what I think you should do. But, but I would not sin against the Lord by not praying for you. Isn't it easy to quit praying for people when we get discouraged? When we think that they have failed too long, too much, when they've disappointed us, when they've hurt us. I think it's easy for us to withdraw our love and to withdraw our faith. And it's shown by the fact that we quit praying for people. And he says, I want you to realize that even though I'm disappointed in you, even though you've hurt me, even though I feel betrayed, I am still gonna pray for you. And that's the third lesson in prayer is that our prayers need to be persistent that we need to continue and keep on praying even when it sometimes seems like we're not getting the answers that we wanted. And we actually are going to be doing some praying. I hope that this last week you have already been involved. We are doing a two-week prayer emphasis. And every day at, at lunch, we are having a short little video that challenges us to pray for some of the needs here in our community, to pray for the needs around the world. And I think specifically I would challenge you that in this time when our schedules are off and we don't necessarily have the going to church kind of schedule that we, we have had in the past, that you need a time to lock in for your spiritual relationship of reading the scriptures, of listening to the message, and of you need to make your own Sunday. And you need to have a community that you pray with, of people that you get together with, maybe physically, people that you maybe pray on the phone with, that you just pray at the same time with. And let me also encourage you parents, you need to pray for your kids. If they're in your home, you need to pray with them. If they're now out of your home, you need to pray for them. If they're in somebody else's home, you need to pray for them. And lastly, I'd encourage you to pray for the church. That we are coming together because we realize that if we can't say all we can do is pray because praying is a powerful and important thing. And so if you go on to familychurchweb.com forward slash prayer um, for this two week period, we are focusing on praying for the same things together. And God is putting on our hearts some exciting new things that we believe he's calling us to do that are God-sized things to do. And we're gonna need you not only to pray, but to ask God to speak to you and to, to nudge you about what you can do in, in this time. 
Sometimes it feels like we can't do much, but we can pray, and that is a lot. So prayer is a powerful thing, and I hope that this challenges you to change how you pray and when you pray and what you pray. So let me give you two things that I want you to think through, to pray about, and to discuss with somebody. What is the hardest part of prayer for you? What is it that distracts you? What is it that changes your heart so you quit praying? Do you tend to see God as a vending machine instead of in a relationship? Do you, do you only call him when you need him? And then the last part is, what helps you pray? And I know that for the last 25 years, we've been meeting in a men's prayer here on, at Sutherland Church, and there's just a couple of us most of the time. But we pray, and that's been such an encouragement to me. And, and I don't know what it is that helps you, but let me encourage you to find those things that help you pray, because prayer is so vital. Let me close our time here in prayer. God, thank you for listening to Samuel and for changing the trajectory of his life and for using him then to impact and change others. Father, we all need help praying. It's a place of battle and of struggle. And I know for myself, it's, it's a place where I easily feel guilty. God, I pray that you would remind us that you're there and that we would call on you not only when things fall apart, but when we're just going through our normal days. And that as Family Church prays together, God, would you move in powerful ways to show that you're listening and to show us what it is you're calling us to do. And make us so that we can pray in honest and raw and just here's what's going on in my heart today kind of language. Father, we need you more than we ever have. And we know that you are right there listening to us and ready to respond. So Father, use this in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. Spend some time praying this week.